Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is inequality. We're joined today by our colleague Brink Lindsay, vice president for research at the Cato Institute and author of Human Capitalism, How Economic Growth Has Made Us Smarter and More Unequal. Brink, we know that income inequality exists, that some people make a ton of money and some people don't make much at all and it bothers a lot of people. I mean outside of any effects it has, just the very existence of this huge disparity in income that we see is, is deeply troubling for a lot of people to the point that they want to do something about it. Um, I guess I want to start by saying is there anything to that, to this – I mean is there something wrong with people earning hugely different salaries or are these people just kind of upset about absolutely nothing? Yeah. I, I think uh, that hostility towards inequality per se is a fairly deep-rooted human sentiment uh, but a fundamentally illiberal one. Uh, that is, uh, there is a fundamental tension between liberty on the one hand and a goal of equality of condition uh, on the other uh, in that uh, given that people uh, naturally have different abilities and preferences, if you allow them to do what they want, they are naturally going to uh, end up uh, dispersed over a, a wide variety of, of economic outcomes. So uh, the only way to stop that is to constantly intervene uh, and override uh, what would otherwise be the natural results of differences in abilities and preferences. Uh, and it would be continuous intervention because once you did it once, then again, these natural differences would reassert themselves. So uh, I think a, a – Again, just a, a, a knee-jerk uh, pining for equality of condition uh, is probably ha hardwired into the human brain uh, in some way or another. Uh, but uh, it's not something; it's not the part of the brain that we want to <laughs> we want to uh, reward uh, in a in a free liberal society. So do we think that the another condition here is marginal utility of wealth? Uh, people might have not necessarily a problem with the money sums in the absolute, but the fact that this guy can buy another thousand dollar bottle of champagne and this guy can't buy water. So there would be one argument that says, that, well, do we, uh, we should allow these inequalities except for the point where a guy can't buy water while the other guy is buying champagne. So there is uh – a completely different set of concerns about whether uh, some people have enough. Uh, that is, are uh, are some people simply below the floor uh, of a decent standard of living? And if they are, uh, then as uh, naturally other regarding people with sympathy for others, uh, we're going to be upset about that and want to do something about it. Uh, but we can lift people up from the bottom uh, and make them better off than they otherwise would have been and above some minimum without in any way affecting the overall unequal pattern of uh, of incomes. So I think uh, you do not have to conflate uh, a concern for the less fortunate and concern for genuine disadvantage and suffering with a thoroughgoing egalitarianism that, that sees as an ideal a complete equality of condition. I wonder if and – And to be honest – this kind of thoroughgoing egalitarianism I think is more or less a straw man. Not many people in American political debate would would uh, sign up and say that's that's me. But I wonder a lot of people when they're talking about this problem with income inequality, there's there is this sense that yeah, there's people at the bottom who don't have enough, but there's also a kind of moral blameworthiness they place upon the wealthy in this distribution, which is to some extent because People think that it's it's because the wealthy have so much that the poor have so little, like a, a zero sum outlook. But also this declining marginal utility of wealth question. There's this idea that it's somehow morally blameworthy to be buying that really expensive bottle of champagne when there are people out there suffering who could be helped 
hugely by you just redirecting that resource somewhere or by that money being taken from you in the form of higher taxes or whatever else. You're kind of shirking your responsibilities as a good person. To be sure, uh, there is zero-sum thinking rampant in public opinion and non-economic thinking rampant in public opinion. Uh, and part of that is the idea that that we live in a zero-sum world so the rich got rich by taking it away from somebody else. And so if the rich are doing better than before, that must mean they're taking out of the hide of others. Uh, and that can be true uh, but uh, it certainly isn't necessarily true. I would say through most of human history, it was true. So the fact that we have kind of zero-sum instincts culturally – is understandable. Uh, so for most of human history, the overwhelming majority of people lived at the edge of subsistence and a tiny aristocratic elite lived very well by the standards of the time, basically by stealing from the masses. Uh, so I think uh, it's understandable uh, that a uh, prejudice arose that rich people are thieves. Uh, and it's only – and that's been going on for thousands of years. It's only in the past couple hundred years of modern economic growth that you had fortunes arise uh, from giving stuff to people that they really wanted. Uh, so superior service uh, as, a, as an origin of fortunes rather than predation is a, is a historical novelty and it hasn't sunk in culturally so much. As to the idea that someone is consuming obscenely, uh, that how can you do – how can you – buy that $1,000 bottle of champagne when there are people suffering uh, down the street uh, is, uh, is I think a kind of accusation uh, that uh, comes naturally uh, to people to aim at people above them without recognizing how then vulnerable they are uh, to the same kind of argument. So anybody in the United States – Doing anything like a normal American standard of living is vulnerable to that charge by the lights of, of – or by the standards of the way most people in the world live. There's 3 billion people on the earth today making do with less than $2 a day. Uh, anything in the bottom quintile of American life looks obscenely uh, uh, self-indulgent uh, by uh, their standards. So uh, I don't think uh, – so I, I think there's something fundamentally wrong then with uh, with uh, with that approach uh, and uh, the fact is uh, that poverty is the natural human condition uh, and that the escape from poverty that has been going on thanks to modern economic growth over the past couple of centuries has been a gradual process which means it started someplace and has been spreading – slowly and deliberately, uh, which means that uh, the transition from a world of mass poverty to a world of mass affluence, that whole transition period is a period of great inequality. Uh, but uh, uh, that I think uh, is not what you should focus on. Uh, you should focus on uh, the direction and where the end goal is, a world where everyone has been liberated from material deprivation. Uh, and so to stop that deliverance process in the name of – uh, objections to the fact that it, it hasn't affected everybody instantaneously is uh, is really short-sighted. So apart from preying on the poor and maybe buying a $1,000 bottle of champagne, maybe not being charitable enough, it seems like some people think that there are types of wealth or maybe specific wealthy people that is bad or or like hedge fund managers or bankers. Bankers have a very long history of being hated uh, and you don't see it with LeBron James, right? There's, they don't criticize the wealth equally. So that seems to be another component here. Sure. Uh, so uh, just to back up a little bit, uh, if inequality per se was a bad thing and a more equal society per se was a good thing, if inequality really is a fundamental indicator of uh, – of Sort of the justice of social institutions, uh, then we would be living in a very different universe than the one we currently inhabit. Uh, the most comprehensive measure of, of income inequality is a number called the Gini coefficient uh, and it runs from zero to one. Uh, zero is perfect equality. Everybody in that society makes exactly the same amount. Uh, one is perfect inequality. One person in that society makes all of the income. Everybody else makes zero. Uh, the U.S. Gini coefficient is about 0.45, pretty high by world standards. A country of, with a comparable Gini coefficient is Uganda, just a little bit less than ours at 0.44, so slightly less unequal than we are. So slightly better, 
then than we are. Uh, and yet on the UN Human Development Index, which takes GDP per capita, life expectancy and educational attainment and uh, balls them together into one number, uh, the U.S. is number three uh, on the UN Human Development Index uh, and Uganda is number 161 out of 187 countries. So the Gini coefficient tells you precisely nothing about how good that society is, how well it, it is uh, run for its citizens, how just its institutions are, etc. Uh, and why is that? Why is there so little informational content that you can glean from the Gini coefficient? It's because that bottom line pattern of incomes is an incredibly complex phenomenon that reflects – thousands, millions of different factors all pushing in different directions. So there are good reasons causing inequality like <clears throat> a economic takeoff where some people are suddenly becoming rich for the first time. Uh, there are – there's good reasons for inequality, whole new industries being created and creating vast new fortunes because uh, someone has figured out how to uh, build a better mousetrap or build a – you know, create a notebook or a uh, – tablet or a smartphone or something that nobody ever had before. <clears throat> uh, and then, of course, there are bad reasons why you can have <clears throat> inequality rising such that uh, uh, people take control of the levers of power and use it to enrich themselves and steal from others. Uh, and traditionally, traditional societies have a lot of that kind of predation and so traditional societies tend to have – be uh, uh, unequal uh, – a la Uganda. We're unequal for very different reasons. Uh, and so again, uh, because there is this baseline knee jerk against inequality uh, and because we all like to moralize all of our debates that we're in, uh, there is a great tendency to just assume that if if high levels of inequality are bad, then they must have arisen for bad reasons. Uh, and yet if you look at the reasons why inequality has arisen in the United States, you can see all kinds of reasons that people on the left might say are bad reasons. But you can see all kinds of reasons as well uh, that people on the left would say are good reasons. So we have, for example, much more liberal immigration, uh, low-skill immigration today than we did uh, from the 20s to the 60s. Uh, and that has exacerbated income inequality basically by bringing in a bunch of uh, unskilled people who uh, who make low incomes. We've shifted the median income downward uh, and created a, a more unequal overall income structure. We have reduced global inequality by doing so greatly uh, because those immigrants now make a lot more than they did back in their home countries and their children do too. Uh, but for U.S. stats, we have worsened the Gini coefficient by – expanding freedom and opportunity for people who really, really needed it uh, and in a way that progressives tend to support. Likewise, a non-trivial uh, component to the rise in unequal incomes in the United States has been greater uh, uh, equality, social equality, freedom, opportunity uh, for women um, that uh, we've had uh, – since the 60s and 70s, uh, opening of a whole range of, of uh, jobs and professions to uh, women that previously had been uh, – they had been boxed out of. And uh, as a result, we've seen really rapid gains of women income relative to men. Uh, as it happens though, uh, we have also assortative mating, uh, which is that people uh, of – tend to marry uh, someone of – similar socioeconomic status and in particular similar educational attainment. And, uh, so uh, what we've seen then, if we didn't have assortative mating, then the big rise in female incomes could have been a leveling factor because the low-income man could have married a now high-income woman and it could have evened the scales. But what has happened is it has exacerbated income inequality because the high-income male is now, instead of having a stay-at-home wife, has a working wife who is also well-educated, highly skilled and commands a high income. Uh, so – here again, uh, a good thing has led to something that someone might think of as a bad result. Uh, so uh, it is to, to really see this whole issue analytically and, uh, and objectively 
you have to step back from this black hat, white hat, moralistic approach to things because uh, something as complex as a Gini coefficient is going to reflect a whole bunch of factors, some of which you like and some of which you don't. And and truly then that that leads, I think, to a to a conclusion that it would be very helpful and very constructive to shift debate away from inequality per se uh, and shift a debate onto possible bad things that are driving up inequality. Then we can argue about whether those are really bad things and if we agree that they're bad things, then we can argue about what to do about it. But those arguments can take place much more constructively without the inequality frame uh, and they're really what we are fo- should be focusing on anyway. So let's talk about some of the trends that we that you've mentioned a little bit because we hear this a lot now. Um, the most in my lifetime, uh, hearing these discussions of whether it's the ninety nine percent, the one percent, and and all these sort of YouTube videos about how much wealth is, we hear this a lot. Uh, so in the general proclamation that inequality is increased uh, under the whatever metrics they're using, whatever studies they're using, uh, do you agree with that? And and how are they measuring that? So the measurement of inequality is one of the great statistical food fights of our time uh, and uh, there's lots of back and forth uh, and choosing what dimension of inequality you want to measure will lead to different conclusions. Um, so you could look at Gini coefficients. You can look at the ratio of the 90th percentile to the 50th percentile, high versus middle. You can look at ratio of the 50th percentile to the 10th percentile, middle versus low. You can look at 90, 10. You can focus on what percentage of, of total income is commanded by the top 10 percent or top 1 percent without paying attention to anybody else. Um, so there's a whole lot of different ways to look at this. Um, but I would say that overall – uh, you can quibble with numbers and I have um, but but I would say that the data are clear enough uh, that there are two different phenomena that have been going on uh, that have pushed incomes in a, in a more uh, unequal direction or towards a <clears> – <throat> they now disperse over a wider range than they used to. Um, and – uh, the first, uh, I would call the one versus ninety nine percent inequality, and that's what tends to attract most headlines. Uh, and that is that uh, incomes at the very top have uh, have uh, experienced rapid growth in recent decades, while incomes in uh, the middle and below have uh, have grown tepidly, if at all. There's dispute whether. There's outright stagnation or maybe some people are actually worse off than they were before. But at the very least, uh, growth for most people has slowed down and growth at the top has been uh, more robust than than ever. So that's going on, growth at the very top. Meanwhile, uh, there is – in addition to 1 versus 99 inequality, there's 30 versus 70 percent inequality. So there's the growing cleavage basically between the highly skilled – more or less the people with college degrees and everybody else. Uh, So as of 1980, the college wage premium, uh, the difference between the average salary for a college grad and the average salary for a high school grad was 30 to 40 percent. Over the course of the 80s, it doubled to 70 or 80 percent and it stayed high ever since. Uh, So uh, we have this uh, growing cleavage uh, between between the highly educated and highly skilled and everybody else. Uh, and this cleavage is not just in income, but it's in a whole lot of other things too. It's in family structure, single parenthood. It's in uh, 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 it's in uh, entertainment preferences. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, kind cul- of like cult- cultural differences. Yeah. Um, NASCAR but, versus uh, yeah. yeah. So there's things that I think people wouldn't think are very important, uh, sort of superficial cultural differences, but family structure uh, and and uh, so that includes uh, marriage out of uh, – or childbearing out of wedlock. It includes divorce rates. Very different uh, levels between the highly educated and everybody else. Didn't used to be that way. Uh, those differences have grown larger. Big difference between uh, – in labor force participation now uh, in an inversion of the uh, of the traditional uh, uh, way that things were where you had the working class or the – less well-off. Those are the people who work for a living and the rich were the leisure class. Uh, now uh, our uh, top income earners work much many more hours per year than the people at the bottom and, and indeed 
the labor force participation rate the, uh, for high school dropouts is around – is like under 50 percent. Uh, so um, uh, there's a lot of just complete – Exit from uh, the workforce uh, at the bottom. Is is that because the people at the top in the income bracket simply want to work more than the people at the lower, or would the people at the lower typically want to work as many hours and boost their income as the top earners do, but don't have an option to do that? It's. I think it's complicated, uh, but in general, many people in the top uh, have jobs that are. Uh, intellectually stimulating, challenging, and confer lots of social status. Uh, and so they're fun to have those jobs and people do them uh, because they pay the bills but also because they are intrinsically enjoyable uh, to a much greater extent than jobs at the bottom. Uh, so the economist's idea that labor is – that work is always disutility is really not true uh, for an increasingly large group of people. Uh, but it remains quite true at the bottom. So work is, is not an attractive option uh, uh, because the work that is done just isn't as interesting and could be physically uh, tiring and exhausting and dangerous. Um, but uh, on top of that, you have uh, a welfare state. Uh, that offers some kind of, of minimum standard of living without having to work. Uh, and if uh, your market wage, if this, your skills, the market value of your skills is roughly comparable to whatever the social minimum is, then you're not very likely to work for a living. You're, it's going to, your least bad option could very well be to be on the dole. So this 30-70 inequality, it's very interesting because I think you're right. You see it in a broader social move. You see a lot of different types of behavior going on uh, between different types of classes. Charles Murray's book talks about this yes. to an extent. Um, yeah, so you know, propensity to vote, propensity to join community organizations, uh, health, exercise, smoking, obesity, they all now cleave on educational lines in a way that they didn't before. Which is that the reemergence of a class divide uh, along educational lines is a, is a new phenomenon in American life and I, I consider it to be an unfortunate one. So from my perspective, uh, although most of the headlines go to the 1 percent versus 99 percent inequality, um, just because those fortunes are so eye-popping and it's, uh, it's easy to be sensationalistic about um, – uh, but to my way of thinking, that uh, that just isn't much of a problem at all. Uh, the fact that the super rich are pulling away from the well healed does not strike me as a as a massive social problem, as an incredibly important problem. Um, where and what what as a liberal, uh, I am most interested in is living in a society where individuals can flourish and thrive in lives of their own choosing. And so what I'm interested in is differences along that dimension. And so if you take me, a policy wonk, uh, and compare me on the one hand to a hedge fund tra a trader uh, or on the other hand to someone who uh, you know, replaces bed pans at nursing homes, um, the income difference – the, the hedge fund trader makes a thousand times more than I do. Um, I make five to ten times more than the cleaning lady. Uh, and yet in terms of the things that – so the inequality is much greater between me and hedge fund guy than it is between me and clean, cleaning lady. Uh, but in terms of the things that I think really matter, opportunity to engage in stimulating, interesting, challenging work that you feel good about and you feel like a productive member of society and uh, – I feel no real inequality between me and the hedge fund trader and I feel a gigantic chasm between me and the cleaning lady. Uh, and so to me, a world in which uh, uh, people are uh, are uh, not getting ahead by developing the kind of skills that do command uh, good uh, – compensation in uh, today's market economy. That's a, a much bigger problem. It affects a lot more people and it affects a much more important matter uh, than inequality at the very tippy top. As I'm listening to you talk, I'm trying to approach this from the perspective of someone not sympathetic to the views that we in this room tend to share. Yep. And 
and I can see them say, listening and thinking, so what you're saying is that the real disparity, the growing inequality, the one that ought to concern us is between these people who have the right kind of skills, the right kind of culture, the right kind of attitudes and are getting these great jobs that are fun and all that and then the people who have this culture that's not synced up with where the money comes from and they aren't taking – they aren't developing their skills and they aren't taking jobs that are demanding in highly skilled ways and you know, and they have higher divorce rates and all these other things and it sounds like blaming the victim or it sounds like that maybe our system if, – if our economic system is such that the – all of the benefits flow to people – to a, a small group who hold a minority's preferences or a minority's cultural beliefs and attitudes that maybe there's something wrong with that system and we need a system that instead works to the benefit of how most people think and act and want to live and most people's capabilities and whatever else. So let's – let me back up and, and to approach that by giving the explanation of where I think uh, this skill-based inequality, uh, this increase in skill-based inequality is coming from. Uh, a fundamental driver of uh, of social change uh, throughout the world and especially the more advanced economies over the course of the 20th century uh, has been uh, that economic development uh, makes society more complex over time. Uh, so first, uh, there's just more knowledge and know-how distributed throughout the system than ever before. Secondly, the division of labor becomes ever more specialized and uh, finely grained. Uh, and then finally, there's just more choices along every dimension of human existence the richer you get. So there's just more moving parts to society interacting in, in, uh, in more different ways. Uh, and this growing social complexity, uh, as I argue in human capitalism, uh, requires uh, people with uh, – who can master that complexity to run things. Uh, and indeed, the more complex uh, the economy gets, uh, the higher the percentage of people you need doing the running things. So in, in an analog to uh, biological evolution uh, where the brain-to-body ratio – uh, grows bigger when animals have more complex behaviors. They need a bigger governor to run all those complex behaviors. As our economy gets more complex, our brain-to-body ratio is growing. The, <clears throat> the percentage of total U.S. jobs that were managerial or professional in 1900 was about 10 percent. Now it's about 35 percent. So uh, that means that, uh, among other things, the growth of uh, the economy uh, has created many more opportunities at the top has created many more opportunities to stretch your mind and develop your inborn uh, talents and capacities to run this incredibly complicated contraption that is a modern economy. Uh, and that's, that's a great story. Uh, and so that's a story that, uh, that is a story of mass human liberation, liberation from boredom, liberation from ignorance, uh, that, uh, that the imperatives of running a modern economy have – catalyzed a huge investment in schooling and otherwise in the development of skills. And so we're much smarter today or m more people are much smarter today as a result of a capitalist development than otherwise would have been the case. And so that's great. Um, the uh, problem that has emerged in uh, recent decades is that the demand – that the economy keeps getting more complex. The demand for highly skilled people keeps rising. Uh, but the supply has not kept pace uh, and we see that in the run-up of the college wage premium. Uh, so if the, if the premium for getting a college degree doubled, uh, then that's a very clear signal from the market telling people we need more highly skilled workers. We need people with more training. Um, and then the fact that that premium has not then come down – uh, means that there hasn't been a commensurate supply response, uh, which is weird. Uh, so it's it's here's this money hanging out there if you get a college degree and yet people are not responding. Interestingly, women are responding. Women's college attendance and graduation rate has continued to climb. Uh, but the male college graduation rate today is the same as it was in 1980. Uh, so uh, 
so there's some inhibition that is preventing people uh, from responding to economic incentives. Uh, and it is preventing them from developing their own native talents and capacities and, uh, and profiting thereby. Um, so in no sense, I think, am I blaming the victim. Uh, I am identifying victims, people who because of, uh, of various reasons uh, are not getting the shake that they deserve to be all they can be and realize their potential. Uh, <clears throat> Once upon a time, people thought that capitalism would thrive by keeping the masses down. Uh, you've got the, uh, you know, the Charlie Chaplin uh, modern times uh, vision of the proletariat just turning that one screw on the assembly line for all eternity, and we couldn't run the machine of a modern economy without all these human drones. But in fact, reality has turned out completely differently. Uh, it's uh, that. As we go along, capitalism wants more and more people to develop uh, a, a broader range of their talents and capacities than before. Uh, and right now, our culture, our educational system, our communities are not producing uh, uh, the supply of these highly skilled people that the economy needs. So there is currently more room at the top. We could have an occupational structure in which there is a – even higher percentage than today of people with interesting, stimulating jobs if our families, communities, and schools could produce the people willing to fill those jobs uh, or capable of filling those jobs. Because they aren't, our occupational structure is more bottom-heavy than it otherwise would have been. So let's find the uh, – I mean it seems like we can start thinking about uh, blame almost to some extent, which is, as you said, more productive than just sitting around and complaining about the fact that these people are rich and saying, well, let's get some people up to the top. Schooling seems to be one thing and, and that would be public schools. But someone listening to this might be thinking, oh, well, you know, Obama and, and presidents for many terms now have been talking about you know, STEM. Many people in STEM think we need to get more people into college with college degrees and, and there's also pushback that that's even a, a good idea because the college might be not worth it for some people to go. So where do we start trying to patch this together? Yeah. So just before I get into possible solutions, let me just dwell a little bit more on, on framing the problem uh, because I think looking at this as uh, a failure to develop human capital uh, as, as a mismatch between the demand for human capital and supply uh, is the appropriate way to look at this and not the way that, uh, that people who rail against inequality tend to. They tend to frame this in terms of wage stagnation and that something happened to the economy uh, so that this growing gap between the highly skilled and everybody else, which is basically that everybody else is stagnating or growing or their <coughs> fortunes are growing very slowly relative to people uh, who, uh, who have higher skills. Um, they tend to see that as the system is somehow or another broken, that the working man is getting fleeced by the system. He's not getting his, uh, his fair shake, that somehow or another uh, markets are, uh, are uh, failing to reward people uh, for their full contributions. I think that's blaming the messenger, uh, that I don't see any evidence of systemic – failures in labor markets that uh, would lead to the conclusion that workers aren't getting their marginal product. Um, so uh, most labor markets have lots of sellers and lots of buyers. That's a classic textbook example of a competitive marketplace. Um, so I don't see any – uh, reason to think that there is some kind of systematic failure in markets so that, so that workers are being systematically underpaid. So the problem isn't that workers are being systematically underpaid. The problem is that too many people just aren't worth very much. Uh, that's the problem. And so rather than saying that this all happened because Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controllers and somehow or another mystically through ways we can't really talk about, that destroyed the union movement and therefore – People don't get paid as much as they used to. That I think is just a, a dead end of really bad history uh, and uh, and leads away from the correct conclusion. The correct conclusion is that we need to build up people in the bottom half uh, and need to uh, 
uh, pay attention to how uh, they can uh, cash in on what the fortunate third have cashed in uh, uh, over the past generation. Um, so how do you do that? Um, first, you know, most obviously, uh, uh, the social institutions charged with human capital formation in our society are our schools. Uh, we have a, a longstanding system of, of uh, government financed and provided uh, public schools for K through 12, and then we have a very complex mix of private and public institutions for post secondary education. Uh, but the 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 core social commitment that we've made through public policy is public education, uh, and uh, and its uh, its basic promise was to address what is currently going on, which is that regardless of your family background, regardless of where you come from, we're going to – you're going to come here for free and we're going to give you the skills you need to thrive and flourish in American society. And that just ain't happening in American public schools anymore. Uh, right now we see uh, the children of, of, of professional parents – uh, come in with a big – come into school at age four or five with a big test score advantage over uh, uh, children from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. And then those test score differences grow slightly over time uh, so that what the public schooling system does, rather than mitigate class differences, uh, it just perpetuates them. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, public schooling just failing to deliver on its fundamental promise. Um, and we have a system that uh, – is clearly deep into the territory of, of diminishing returns. Uh, we spend two, three times as much per pupil as we did 30, 40 years ago, graduate a lower percentage of kids from high school than we did 40 years ago, and test scores are about the same, marginally higher in some at some ages and in some subjects and marginally – anyway, very little uh, improvement in test scores with a, a – i.e. outputs, with a huge infusion of additional inputs, money. Uh, so that suggests that uh, that to get better education for our kids, we're going to have to have a fundamental redesign of the system because this system isn't, isn't delivering better results for more money. Uh, so we, we have a, a structural problem. Um, so I think looking at structural redesign of our K-12 schooling system is, is – Incredibly important and big shock as a Cato Institute guy. I'm I'm going to think that's that's uh, that <clears throat> that the the main uh, focus of reform should be in instilling additional competition uh, so that uh, schools compete against each other for students and uh, the ones who do a good job grow and uh, the ones that don't shrink and die just like uh, in the marketplace. So that good schools can then uh, grow over time and scale over time and bad schools will wither and die. We don't have anything like that kind of system today. I, I think we would be in a much better world if we did. Um, that said, I think that uh, a lot of uh, the differences in human capital uh, that we see and that are important today uh, are already present by the time kids show up at school and are – some of them are – pretty hard to budge after that point. So what happens uh, – meanwhile, people live most of their lives outside of school. So they're subject to – even if school is pushing in the right direction, there may be bad influences elsewhere that are swamping those good influences. So uh, I think family life and uh, – and, uh, is an incredibly important part of the picture. Uh, and we see uh, clear class-based differences between uh, parenting at, for at working class or underclass families versus parenting in upper middle class families. Much greater stress on intellectual stimulation, uh, uh, much greater stress on uh, time management and on long time horizons uh, than uh, – than lower down in the social ranks uh, and that family life uh, where uh, at the top where every moment is a teachable moment uh, uh, is just a constant nonstop training ground for amassing the kind of human capital that you need to ultimately to do well in school, to like school uh, and therefore to get the credentials and the skills you need to do well. 
so um, – and I, I think there are some interventions that can be tried to help kids from disadvantaged families. Uh, but I don't hold out huge hopes uh, that, that anything revolutionary uh, can happen uh, basically uh, because uh, – we want to grant families a great deal of autonomy and it's creepy and and even oppressive uh, to dive too deep into family life and have the state uh, be uh, the surrogate parent. Um, so I think our the, – the main action, even if, even if uh, the family may be a more important source of inequality, uh, there's limited things we can do about that. We can do more at school and I think – that the main takeaway uh, policy recommendation that comes from uh, from my book, Human Capitalism, is uh, that a dramatic overhaul in our educational system is is our best bet for uh, making progress on on this issue and truly expanding the number of people who have the wherewithal to uh, flourish and thrive in contemporary society. Listening to that, I'm struck by how. Big of a project that sounds. I mean, you've said that in order to address this income inequality, we need to fix by overhauling our educational system. We need to somehow improve parenting on a large scale. We need to do something about culture, and and that sounds. I mean, that's a big project. It's not an easy project. What about someone says, well, maybe that's just too much to do. It's it's not feasible. But you've said that the that the people at the top of the distributions often aren't doing this for money, or their jobs are much more satisfying, much more fun. They they're working long hours because they like them, and they get other things besides a paycheck out of it, status, whatever else. So they would keep doing them potentially, even if they were making marginally less than they are now. So why not just redistribute? which is going to be far easier than fixing culture and so we increase welfare or as some people have argued, have a guaranteed minimum income, which is just going to be – that's we could institute that tomorrow say as opposed to fixing the scope of United States culture. Yeah. So uh, the problem is you can't redistribute what needs to be redistributed. <laughs> uh, so you can redistribute money. Uh, so it's true that you could give more money to people at the bottom by taxing people at the top more. Um, our Gini coefficient in the United States uh, uh, post-tax uh, is uh, more dramatically different from Europe's than, than our pre-tax Gini coefficients are. So the main reason – uh, European – Western European countries are less unequal than us is because they do more uh, – uh, taxing and redistributing. So you can do that. You can you can get better numbers. But that does precisely nothing uh, uh, to affect uh, the things that I care most about, which is people actually developing their inborn talents and capacities and and living lives of of purpose and challenge and reward. Uh, so – and indeed uh, – by reducing the absolute costs of not developing those skills, by making the social safety net cushier, uh, you uh, reduce the incentives to uh, to develop talents and skills. Uh, by reducing the gap between uh, the highly skilled and the unskilled, you reduce the economic incentive to develop skills. Uh, now, I'm not saying that those that those cur the current differences are sacrosanct uh, and that there are, that those incentives are absolutely necessary but but I am saying that uh, that if you are truly interested in a in a more egalitarian society in the ways that matter most not money income but quality of life um, a fiscal redistribution scheme isn't going to get you where you want to go and may even make it harder to get there. I think I've seen that in in England. I've I've seen that a lot. That they have a I mean, they already have a pre-existing class system, but but an incredibly generous welfare state. I mean, we have these sort of debates all the time and about you know how much does a disincentive to work, how much is there? But if you just imagine an incredibly lavish welfare state, 
then you wouldn't want to develop yourself, and you, and you would want to, and then you would create an entire dependent class that that had sort of lost human potential uh, left behind. And, and I, I fear that we're moving in that direction. So if uh, no matter what happens, uh, the richer we get, the higher the social minimum that is going to be. That is the the general shared perception amongst members of that society about the floor below which it's just indecent to live. Uh, and so if we have a welfare state or if we have libertopia with private charity, that same dynamic is in effect. Maybe the it's the libertopia shifts the curve down, but the, it's still the slope is the same in that the richer you get – uh, the the higher the floor that you think people shouldn't fall below. Color uh, TV. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> poverty is a is to some extent a relative concept. Um, so uh, if uh, we can get by con- maintaining economic growth and innovation uh, while wasting the potential of large numbers of people, uh, if uh, if we can keep the ball rolling. Um, with economic growth uh, and innovation, then society as a whole will get richer and the floor will grow higher. If if growth, overall growth happens faster than growth in human capital, then what you're going to end up doing over time is just having more and more people's market value be below the social minimum, which will push them out of the workforce and onto the dole. So I could picture a world where a creative, productive uh, – Working class is the elite and you have a large proletariat leisure class that sort of is kept quiescent with bread and circuses uh, and that's a terrible society to want to live in. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think uh, when thinking about welfare state redesign, uh, there has been um, a lot of commentary in recent months just kind of uh, on this idea of an unconditional basic income or a guaranteed basic income. Um, and I I can see uh, arguments in favor of that, at least relative to the welfare state status quo. Our welfare state status quo is incredibly expensive, incredibly inefficient, also incredibly intrusive and hectoring and, and, and uh, condescending towards its subjects. Uh, the one thing we know governments can do competently is cut checks. Uh, so, uh, so if we just boiled the welfare state down to cutting checks to everybody, uh, uh, then I, I can see a libertarian argument for that. And indeed, that libertarian argument was made 50 years ago by Milton Friedman when he uh, advanced the idea of a negative income tax. However, if we're going to do some sort of clean sweep uh, redesign of the welfare state, uh, along those kinds of lines of cutting checks. My own inclination would be not to basically subsidize joblessness uh, along the lines of a basic income, but rather to have a system of wage subsidies uh, that that pay employers for hiring low-skilled people. That is, instead of accelerating the mismatch between the uh, market value and the social minimum, you now – uh, <clears throat> turbo, you amplify or add to the market wage to get that above the social minimum to keep people in the workforce. So I think a welfare state that is designed with positive work incentives to keep people engaged in the economy, which then is uh, uh, gives them incentives to develop and maintain uh, skills and capacities is much more likely to lead to a world where more people are living better lives than a world with a big unconditional dole. And that seems to be the kind of world that that I advocate for uh, an, an equal world in in one way, which is that I want people to have equal happiness, equal chances for happiness. And that's something I think is interesting. You know, in a, a market economy, you're going to get a lot more chances to live the kind of life that you would want to live. You know, this this thing that happened with the puppeteer. Uh, in the uh, Occupy Wall Street, ever said, "Oh, we got to criticize right. the puppeteer," as opposed to being like, "I want to live in a world where puppeteering is a profitable endeavor," because sure. the toil world is the farm world, and there aren't, aren't even opera singers. So you could have incredible inequalities of wealth in that world, but maximization of human capital, where people are doing jobs they really enjoy, and they're like, "Okay, yeah, I'll stop at eighty thousand dollars a year because it's a great job," and and that's we don't have that with the losing the human capital. That that's a, just brings up an interesting point about the kind of unavoidability. Of, of 
some measure of increasing income inequality. Um, measure – you can measure in – Income inequality in a bunch of different ways. One way to split it is is uh, with between group inequality, basically different skill levels and what they earn, and then within group inequality, at a certain skill level, what's the spread of incomes within that cohort? Um, there's an economist, I believe his name is Thomas Lemieux, who some years ago in an American Economic Review article argued that virtually all within group inequality. Uh, was simply a function of demographic change, uh, that the run-up in within-group inequality was due to the fact that we have an older and better educated population today than we did in the early 70s against which we benchmark these changes. And basically, the older and, uh, and better educated you get, uh, the more naturally incomes are going to diverge. When everybody is young and unskilled, then all incomes are going to be more or less equal. They're going to clump at a very low level. But when, as people age and as they have, uh, as they have, <coughs> you know, are better educated, they can pursue a much wider variety of lifestyles. So they can choose to work like a dog and be a hedge fund trader, or they can choose to uh, move to a small college town and run some groovy craft store. And uh, and uh, so you you can do your choices are much wider. So the 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 scope over which differences in preferences uh, can play out. Uh, grows over time. So I think a free, rich society is necessarily going to be a fiscally unequal society because people are going to make different choices and some people are going to value money more than others. Um, and that's great. Right? So, But uh, uh, we would like to live in a world where those differences do reflect choices rather than reflecting the fact that you chose the wrong parents. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.